Nick Saban in Alabama rolled into town today. Now, you know we've had Nick Saban on the show a couple of times, but you know what we haven't been able to do? We haven't been able to sit down with him and have him on the show face-to-face. So we figured, you know, why not? Coin landed on heads. Let's decide to have Nick Saban on the show. And so he joined us for a good 10 minutes, and we covered a variety of topics that I wanted to get a little bit more in-depth on. Specifically, I think he gives a really brutally honest answer about scheduling, brutally honest answer about NIL. You don't need to hear me tell you that, though. Here is Nick Saban from earlier today. Alabama head coach Nick Saban rolling through SEC media days. You're almost at the finish line here, and I assume you've been asked the same thing about a million times. Has there been anything today where you just get tired of saying, I don't know, I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know what's going to happen, because I've heard that a lot lately. Well, there's a lot of hypothetical questions being asked about what's going to happen in the future, and I don't think anybody really has uh, a clear view of the solution um, about the future. So um, I don't really have the answer to it either. So I have been saying, I don't know. A lot of people want to talk about NIL. And one of the themes I've started to hear you mix in a lot more is who's protecting the players. And you talk about the NFL structure a lot. And you've got an agent. You've got structure. And everyone knows what they can do. NIL is kind of what NIL is right now. But when you talk about the need to protect players, what specifically do you mean? Uh, exactly what you said. You know, um, you know, there's more and more people trying to get between the player and the money. Uh, these people have to have no qualifications. Um, who knows what kind of advice and direction they're giving to players, how they're protecting players from signing, you know, deals that may not be in their best interest or, you know, may create future problems for them in terms of other things that they're doing. You know, college guys are still student athletes. You know, where they're involved in personal development, they're involved in academics, they're involved in developing a career off the field, they're involved in, you know, developing a career on the field. Uh, So, um, you know, like you said, the NFL has a Players Association. Players Association govern govern agents uh, to protect the players. Our players in college don't have anyone to protect them uh, and make sure the people who are representing them are qualified to do that. Competitive balance is a phrase a lot of people outside this world have used for a long time just about watching some of the haves and have-nots. It's a theme I've heard you hit on a lot lately. Sometimes when people hear the big dogs say competitive balance, they look and say, but they already win. Why would he talk about that? And yet, I heard you today. I've heard you recently. You've said, look, we're one of the haves. So it's not necessarily us being victimized. So when you extend it beyond Alabama, if nothing changes, What's the ultimate outcome of maybe the path the sport's on? Well, the ultimate outcome is going to become all about money. And the ultimate outcome will move away from development uh, of college students. We, we all went to college to develop value for our future. Is that not true? Um, we matured personally. Um, we got an education. We developed a career by graduating. Uh, in lots of cases, guys had an opportunity to play at the next level. Uh, whether they played baseball, football, basketball, it didn't matter. Um, so college was about developing. Where can I create the most value for my future? Um, but it's going to be about who's going to pay me the most money and use name, image, and likeness as the vehicle to do that um, through collectives, which a collective is just the opportunity for alumni who we've always tried to keep out uh, of recruiting, who we've always tried to keep out of directing money toward players. The collective creates an opportunity in a legal fashion right, to do this and funnel money to players, right, which I'm okay with that because it's good for players. I don't know if it's a sustainable model, right, but I'm okay with that. But when you use that in recruiting, then it becomes, I'm just going to go where I can get the best deal rather than focus on where can I go and create the most value for my future. And, you know, that's the part that um, is very concerning, I think, you know, to me in terms of competitive battle. So it'll be about who wants to buy the best team. Um, and there are going to be lots of people who don't have the resources to do that. We're not one of them. 
So I'm not talking about Alabama getting affected in this. People think that when I talk, I'm like trying to protect Alabama. I'm really trying to protect the integrity of college athletics, not just college football. You know, people don't understand that there's only so much money to go around. All right, so how is this going to impact other programs all right, that have given how many student athletes an opportunity to compete, uh, to develop a career? If you're in track and field and you got a scholarship to go to college, it gave you an opportunity to go to the Olympics. I mean, how much is all that going to be impacted by this? Because there's only so much money to go around. All right, so um, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, we come up with some guidelines all right, that allow us to keep the integrity of college sports intact and keep competitive balance in those sports. One of the biggest things I think even I've heard coaches differ in opinion on is what the right scheduling model is. you got two new teams coming into the conference, but I think a lot of folks love watching Alabama football. People don't get so stoked when they wake up on a Saturday morning and know Bama's favored by 48 today. And I've heard you talk a little bit lately about how you don't prefer that either. You want games that people want to see, but you can't just snap your fingers and make it happen. So, right. I mean, what? I guess I'm asking you, what is the best overall format and how feasible is it to actually make it happen? Well, you know, I've coached in the NFL for eight years. So you've got 32 teams. Every rule in the NFL creates competitive balance, salary cap. Um, if you have a good season, you play a more difficult schedule. If you have a good season, you draft later. If you have a bad season, you draft earlier. I mean, everything they do is to cr try to create everybody to be 8-8 eight and eight in the NFL. Because if everybody's 8-8 eight and eight and you're coming to the last game of the season, there's going to be tremendous fan interest to see who gets in the playoffs. But when you have these teams that go 13 and 3 and they don't even play the best players at the end of the season, because right, they're saving them for the playoffs, how much fan interest does that create? So I think we need to respect fans, fan interest, traditions, and the integrity of those traditions in terms of how the interest that it creates in college football. All right, if attendance goes down, then how does that impact us in a positive way? So to play quality games is the most important thing. All right, but our rules don't enhance us playing quality games because you got to win, have a winning record to get in a bowl game. Why don't we do it like basketball? Have some rating system that even if you went five and seven, but you played a really good schedule and you beat some pretty good teams, you could go to a bowl game rather than trying to create a schedule where you play four teams that you know you're going to beat, and if I can just win two other games, I'll be bowl eligible. And that's important to my program. And it's important to me keeping my job. All right, so, but how about the fans? Do they want to go see these games? So, you know, it was, I don't know how many years ago, six, eight years ago, I said, why don't we play nine games in the SEC? All right, now they want, they're talking about playing nine in the future. I'm saying, why don't we play ten? All right, we had one season, all right, which was a great competitive season. We didn't play one game that everybody wasn't interested in. So would you lose more games if you played that? Probably. Would, but there would be a lot more interest, all right, which I think is the most important thing, the stadium being filled. The passion and the spirit of the fans makes college football what it is. Let's protect it. You got me. Last question on the field. Everybody's excited about Will Anderson. I just want to ask you about the pass rush in general. Braswell, Dallas Turner, guys like that. I mean, how exciting is that to go out on the practice field and know that you've got that weapon in your back pocket? Well, pass rush is really, really important. And we've gone through some years where we didn't have great pass rushers, and we've gone through some years when we did. And those three guys that you mentioned are all really good pass rushers. It affects the way you can play defense. All right, you can rush four guys. You can play coverage with seven. You don't have to add extra guys into the rush. Uh, you can do simulated pass rushes because those guys are athletic and they can drop and are worried about blocking them, but now all of a sudden they're not rushing. You don't have to play a lot of man-to-man -man in the back end because you want to rush five and six guys, which puts a lot of pressure on you know, another part of your team in the back end. 
Uh, so just the whole way that you can play defense when you can affect the quarterback with a four-man rush and sometimes even a three-man rush, right, which creates more multiples to confuse the quarterback, which is ultimately what you're trying to do on defense. Um, so I think having those kind of guys is really, really important and uh, certainly something that can help us be a good defensive team. Nick Saban, appreciate you joining us. All right, thank you. And big thanks to Nick Saban for joining us today. They actually had to get out of here a little bit early. I'm told they had to skip part of Radio Row because of the weather that has rolled in. Very prophetic, as it turns out. Did you notice, though, what he said there? Because there was a lot. I really started to have my eyes open when he was talking about scheduling. And he basically shot down one of the big lies. We talk about the big lies in college football all the time on Late Kick. And one of them is you are what your record says you are which is a flat-out lie, especially in college football. But people are terrified of it, as he said. And he suggested something I don't think I've heard people suggest before, which is when you're determining strength of schedule, when you're determining how to fill out the playoff and the bowl structure, why don't you have a rating like RPI does in college basketball to where people get rewarded if they play the tougher schedule and they drop some games – all 10 and 2s, all 9 and 3s, all 8 and 4s aren't treated equal. We dive deeper than that. Now, in the power rating world and the sports betting and odds making world, they've done that for a long time. What he's saying is maybe if we did that and you knew you weren't going to get crucified, you weren't going to be labeled as playing meaningless games in November because you had a few losses, maybe people would schedule up a little bit more. He also said, I'm on the hook for 10 conference games if we want to play 10 conference games. I don't think he's going to get broad based support for that. Because everyone else looks around and says, yeah, well, you're Alabama, we're not. You don't have to play Bama, we do. But I thought there was a lot that I kind of listened to and I kind of just nodded my head because it's really nice to hear it you know, from other people besides just on this show. 